This is not a race against the machines. This is a race with the machines. To like again being here is so inspiring because i mean very wonderful to be intellectually deep minds and souls together it's believe me when you're in an everyday tech giants are not always every talk is deep enough so great to be here again um, i think just that you know we're recording this and we put it on yes. the website is that okay yes definitely okay. thank you um so in general i think what is um very fun to say maybe is first i'm not alone i represent 12 people so we are, as a team i've been developing ideas and i think i was eight years old uh, that movie changed my life but i think through innovation and discoveries start to appear when i became a team because back in before that being alone in the game was not that exciting as uh, being a team and imagine together or discover together so uh and I'm teaching at UCLA last five years, uh, and Kay Zarias, one of my hero and mentor, and uh, Greg Lean, and of course, Frank Gehry, and there are many wonderful minds allow me to become who I am, I guess. So I, every talk, I appreciate the mentors and the teachers first. Um, so I, I think I'm happy to get a questions or give a little bit keynotes of past projects that what was the connection that really triggered things? Uh, maybe I can quickly show you my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think what is really, I mean, normally if I have a, a long lecture opportunity, I would love to share the journey in like three chapters because it's kind of given more context and discourse. But I think in a very quick way to say that um, the, the early findings was really inspiring city that I'm born in. And, and in, in Istanbul is a very unique place. I don't know if you've ever been in, but it's a really, really like the feeling of many centuries in one location, left and right, west and east, black and white, like you name it, every contrast context. And, and you, 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 you can feel sometimes completely undesigned because there is no place to design something. And sometimes you cannot innovate because you have centuries of decisions. It's a really unique feeling of the city. But again, I think that's one of the reasons when I watch Blade Runner, the idea of a buildings can be bigger, <laughs> cars can fly, and all this context of life in downtown Los Angeles, and I mean, a machine to machine dialogues. But I think what was really more inspiring for me was a very maybe cliche start of computers. And I was eight years old when I got my first computer. And I start like playing games and the same year, a little bit coding with the machines, but I think I became a clinically <laughs> game addicted, like since my high school, very openly. And, and I think what, what was really inspiring is that there's a space in the mind of a machine and that space, I mean, conceptually a space that the game is, you know, inhabits, right? Is, is something that you cannot touch but you know it's there. And that feeling of virtual context of a space appeared to me in when I was eight years old. And I think that's one of the reasons when I was, I mean, many of us, I'm sure when we are young, right? We have imaginary friends. <laughs> we have like a spaces that we think about. For me, what was boring is my, my room. Like why this room is so boring? Every day, the same thing. When you open that door, behind that door, the same like floor, same ceiling, same window. And I guess this playing a game between our built environments and their context started back in then. And I think also very major shift for me was architectural photography because photography found me at least uh, from my humble opinion, it's really like one of the ways of capturing memory and a memory that is less not time and space, but also like truly, and you have the purpose of like, this is a moment and you can, you know, reconstruct a reality based on where you are looking. So I was very fortunate to work with Martin Parr or Han Pamuk back in my um, early years as in my undergrad years. So they really helped me a lot actually to understand, like especially Orhan Pamuk's um, maybe story, you may know the Museum of Innocence. I was one of the uh, heavy lifter of every single object in his book he was mentioning, uh, like recorded every, all of these objects and things. But I think the true jump, if you're aware of um, maybe in, in Europe, there were like not too many things going on interestingly in 2009 and eight in terms of media arts. But because of my scholarship at the school uh, where I was getting my um, undergrad degree, we were, we have to work to get a scholarship. 
and then so that means like you have to push your own you know imag imagination and, and and capacity and uh, um i think uh, your intelligence and what they challenged me was from the zkm uh, it's an institution in Karlsruhe, and where you can see the origins of media art pieces and Peter Weibel, one of the most, I think, important figure in media arts and media archaeology, he was running the, um, uh, he's still running the institution, but this, these artworks were pretty much every individual important artwork from 70s, 80s, and 90s. The people who were like very first imagining with machines, very first ideas with immersive environments like Jeffrey Shaw, Peter Weibel, like these are really very like a hero minds who have been, you know, programming the first GPUs like imitating machines to like create games in the context of installations. So I was very lucky to really see those pieces and understand how they work. And then the second, second I think, jump in my life, I guess, is a very unique event in, in Berlin. And there was a group of people, including like white hackers from Berlin, and they were like coming together in a very beautiful event. And they were trying to say, how can be architecture used by embedding media arts and technology into it and turn the facades into a communicative experiences. Of course, including advertising and other things. But for me, the event really opened my mind by this wonderful piece by Lev Manovich. He was one of the speaker, he was one of the contributor of the event. And he was saying, in other words, architects along with artists can take the next logical step to consider the invisible space of electronic data flows as substance rather than just as void, something that needs a structure, a politics, and poetics. I think, I'm sorry, there's a 2004 um, to really imagine this universe is something was like just the biggest, like, um, how can I say, the inspiration, but also like the feeling of, I should do that as a, like a life experience. Um, and now I believe when you see a data flow in my work, um, I'm openly and proudly saying, this is one of the most inspiring texts. If you're interested, please have a look at it really deep and very perfect predictions here in this thing, in, in this uh, article. And then the light became, I think the best material since then. And I guess also, the beauty of democratic augmentation of spaces without any gravity problems in physics, right? Lights, it is context in the material reality. And also, I think I was much more inspired by the idea of, of course, like the painting itself, the framing itself, like this biased or limited imagination of arts. Like how can we go expand the boundaries of perception? How can we look at the past that people were like augmenting the built environments? And how can we go back time and then reinvent these ideas? So since then, I guess 2009, the journey started and then start augmenting buildings all over the world and try to give them a life or a context of consciousness or let them, you know, move forward beyond the perception of time and space. And I've been like creating these experiences all over the, all over the I think, uh, different cities and different buildings for different, you know, um, narratives. And I did my very first data sculpture, 2011, for Istanbul Biennale. And, and the curatorial team was looking for an idea that is just beyond um, a, a physical experience, but something has a dialogue with the public space. And there I jump onto the big challenge of like, can we record the memory of a street? A street, it is 1.3 kilometers. In a, weekend, in a weekend, 3 million people may pass, protest the most beautiful, the most heavy, the most emotionally deep space of the urban space can be recorded. And then around those times, I understand that data can actually become a space. Data can become a pigment. Data can become a form, a shape, an expression, a poet, poem. So by the way, this is my very first code I, I remember, like I memorized 46 lines of code from Ken Perlin, another NYU professor who I think did this code in 2000, 1986. He got the award, the year almost I born. And an award, academy award for this code was because of its capacity of creating functional landscapes, ocean, clouds, and mountains. Very godly idea of a code can reconstruct the reality. Yeah, so anyway, the, since then, I think I just obsessed with the idea of using you know, the frame and its context and the data and the algorithms, the invisible world of information around us. Um, so, and, and, and I think what is really I think make me much more um, really went deeper is not only I think technology, but I think science fiction was really became a pure inspiration in the journey. Um, and of course, Philip K. Dick, one of his 
many of us probably aware of his fantastic vision, but also like William Gibson's, my, my hero and Twitter friend, and now he became a friend <laughs> in a good way. Uh, he, he was in a, one of our installations with a beautiful words um, he was sharing. But I think true deep understanding for me is not just, you know, techno fetishly imagine what the machine can do, but really understand also like what exactly changing in our lives, in our DNA, our gene, our like collective memories, and how we are becoming new entities with the machines and their contexts, but also how are we becoming this new like multidimensional consciousness, right? Like we don't know where we are. And I'm pretty sure many upcoming generations like spending enormous time in this virtual space. So sense of displacement became a really big inspiration in the works that you are seeing, most likely in the immersive environments. I think, and also, I mean, it's a good or bad thing, but we know that young generations can perceive information in a couple of seconds through any open source data. And, and I, I'm hearing always the same thing from friends in Europe, like why am I waiting in the queue for two hours to see something while I can just reach, like, I know what they mean, and they don't maybe appreciate physical quality of experience, but these are becoming a really interesting, I think, um, experiences. And I think John Mayer is a really wonderful mind, speculates this design is a solution to a problem, art is a question to a problem. And I found that to really understand all these problems, I just asked the biggest, maybe the simplest question or the hardest question, really, what does it really mean to be a human in the 21st century? So I think this question eventually led me to something um, very, very inspiring because what I found that technically or conceptually or contextually, when humans, machines and environments communicate or collaborate, there a serendipity starts to appear. And that serendipity experience is what I think um, we are seeing in the work that I've been sharing, and especially physical and virtual world and, and when they collide, suddenly a new universe open up. So that's, I think, what, what had been done in the past. Um, so as I came to Los Angeles, to <laughs> the dreaming Blade Runners, this amazing image, but this is an image when I came to Los Angeles 2012, that was not anything close to a flying car or like a stop, you know, it was a very different experience. But to be honest, if you think about uh, like a media artist working in the public space, because what I found, by the way, very maybe humbly to say, I don't think art should belong to museum and galleries. It's a very boring 21st century idea. Open a door behind it, there is art. It's just not, I think, the most creative way of sharing art. So I found myself in the streets. So I have been like, you know, in the cables with the machines. I think the art should belong to public art that is at least has also become a public art that is for anyone, any age, any background, like no floor, no ceiling, no door. Like that, that openness of an idea was really inspiring, uh, I think. I hope it's inspiring for many people. Uh, so as a team, our biggest challenge is how can we create this you know, universal language of um, experience that is really unbiased, borderless, and can feel from any human being has a capacity of like perceiving reality in any level. Um, and then connect with the mind and soul if possible. So anyway, but I can go forever, but it is many ideas, but you are here with your, I'm sure, questions or dialogues. Um, and, and, but this building this today, I think was really inspired me a lot because again, um, one of the most functional <laughs> part of a Frank Gehry's beautiful Disney Hall is home of LA Philharmonic. And I can talk about this project if you wish, or I can select handpick couple of projects, deep dive into them, and uh, really open dialogue. Because here, the, the keynote is really very, very, um, I think, <laughs> yeah, so this goes really long. But, but, but maybe, <laughs> as I, I in my note, like what is thinkable is possible, as Wittgenstein said, I think the idea was here, can this building dream and hallucinate was the question, very humbly. Um, and I think when I asked the question, people were saying, oh, like my mentors, you're a student, like you are a foreigner, like who are you emailing Frank Gehry? How can you think that LA will give you a response? Like very openly, this was my like very first reactions from many friends and colleagues. And I said, oh, that's a beautiful reaction. That means I found another wall <laughs> that we have to break these walls. But the, the awesome thing I think happened, Microsoft Research Award was very important. And I even, I even didn't know that I'm on a stage next to Bill Gates and many wonderful minds. With my short, I was just sharing next to wonderful minds. And, and that was a beautiful support project because this was a, um, a financial award. 
an academic award that makes impossible projects possible. Um, and then very funny, later on, I became also part of uh, Bill Gates um, also uh, collection. But what was really amazing is people were saying like, you cannot do that. It will not work. You are like, whatever. But then a week later, Frank Gehry's team shared his, you know, drawings, <laughs> like, oh, why not? Let's have a look at it. Let's explore. So what I'm trying to say is I think if we are stuck in our own <laughs> simple dream challenges, uh, we will be very limited, I think, as, you know, as humans. But what is beautiful is like then project turned into a real project later on. Um, and the first one at Disney Hall transforming uh, into SF Solonan's wonderful collaboration and Edward Varese's piece, Amerique. Uh, inspired from the first pavilion back in 1958 and where I think the first arts, media arts, cinema, music and architecture were coming together and heavily inspired by the body motion of the conductor and the idea was what will happen if Esapeka not only conducts the sound and time but also he conducts the space, like conducts the polygons of the building and 3D geometry of the space. So this was a, like a um, very first project 2014 as a team we produced and and I was shaking because I never met Frank Gehry and they said he's in the he's in the like uh, audience and he said he may come to green room and he may say hi and I was just shaking if people will like it it's a 25 minutes performance in real time graphics it's really disruptive for for some people it may be but the good news uh, or, or or the other challenge was the building was not designed for you know augmenting the original design of the building was designed for conventional performances but when you say no we have these projectors you have to augment and hack the architecture like if you see it here like we are finding those giant machines trying to fit them in a sound room and also frank gary i mean he's a very strong mind and i and i know that he's not happy if the idea doesn't have authenticity if the idea doesn't have a, like a you know profound context so but the good news he was in the green room and he was very positive and he was saying, we don't need maybe screens anymore. Maybe the architecture can be a part of truly the stage and the performance. So the feeling is something like that. I'm showing it because when your hero really touch your idea, <laughs> supports you, the, the, the feeling becomes um, unique and more supportive. And this is our studio, the very first one. This is our team at the moment, 12 people, 12 language. And try to be diverse as much as possible and doing our best to be borderless and, and try to imagine things beyond just galleries and museums. Um, mostly working with um, tech giants, interestingly, in a good way that's saying, this, this may be a cliche startup page, but we don't do just you know, um, work with these logos. It's purely collaboration and algorithms and hardware and research and um, really very unique collaborations going on all over this scale. Um, but I think what, what is really also uh, interesting for, for a studio is, uh, as we all know, the data is our new kind of <laughs> like a language, a new thing to understand and perceive. We have an enormous information about how data transforming into a new entity. Dataism, maybe we can call it like that. But we know that we are surrounded by these machines and we know that our egocentric decisions are becoming a problem. Every like, every share, every comment is some impact in like in some scale, in some part of nature is epically and problematically like transformed. And I think like, Jack, is, I think Jack Byrne has this beautiful quote, like the specific function of art has been to show that art does not reside in material entities, but in relations between the people and the between people and the components of their environment. And I think very humbly to say life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forward, says the Kiergaard. It's pretty true. I mean, I think the data is exactly what it is to understand the life that what we have right now, spending our time with the machines and the environments, we have to like really look at back to really understand what we pass behind us. So I think these are like a very high level mindset in the studio and that we are very much inspired by these, these ideations. Um, and, um, and also I think what is um, really very unique uh, that maybe um, can be, uh, by the way, Aldous Huxley, another like a uh, wonderful mind that I'm, I'm, I think heavily inspired by a lot of um, books but i think this book was really inspiring when i opened the book i remember 2012 if the doors of perception were clean everything will appear to man as an infinite i think that was one of the reasons this this project called infinite 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 room is traveling all around the world um, and this very childish dream you open this door and that door opens a new dimension and in that universe everything can become anything and the time and space may melt um,
And another maybe inspiring project that truly changed the trajectory of the studio is maybe this piece. Maybe you remember this image from the deep dream, right? This group of people I think was really essential for understanding AI in a creative context. And I was very fortunate to work with the team from the deep dream, which was an, the same team also was a part of a uh, uh, open event in San Francisco, 2016, February in gray area. And it was the first event, as far as I know, that was also doing an auction with AI art to support the community in San Francisco. And I was one of the part of this event. I was the only one who doesn't know how to use AI and the rest was like a genius engineers and people who knows how AI works. But they said it's a perfect model of residency. So basically they were looking for um, people to work with data, but also for the first time understand how to use AI. And I think in the same time, I was very aware of like around the same time, I was very aware of like the AI is something that has like this problem and ramifications were very getting obvious, right? Like we know that it's just a very strong relation between a machine and its context of consciousness is not something we can perceive like that immediately. And it already became a product, but also I'm very funny. I'm, I'm always like trying to show this. So when you think about Google, right? Back in time, they have this like Google Glass, right? This, this big, amazing, fantastic tool that are functioning for the purpose of augmented our perception. But this was their original <laughs> images, but the reality was something like that. So we know that not every product has a quality of um, feature, but AI cannot be like this, right? AI cannot be like having a dream like this and then fail in this level. But the beautiful thing is also, again, dreaming about Blade Runner, the 2016, when I was starting the residency, like this, this machine was getting the first approval to fly in San Francisco. And we all know that this machine supporting, assisting our life, they were learning new languages every single day. And then we know that things are not exciting all the time with the social networks that we have been inhabiting. And while all this going on, I thought that it's a one-time opportunity to not to spend time on just ramifications, but think about creativity. And that was a really inspiring thing because we know that like DeepMind team, for example, they were trying to create this very exciting, by the way, if you're interested, they have an incredibly exciting documentary on YouTube. You can watch this really, really, I think, powerful, and meaningful. But also like we know that there's a science going on that people are trying to find a material that can compute. And we know that some research is epically <laughs> doing things such as predicting the thoughts like 11 seconds before. And we know that Elon Musk has just such a, like a small amount of money is trying to upload, download data from a human mind. So 2016, this was my year, you know, like reading all these things and getting inspiration. So that's where I just very lucky to get the residency at AMI. And I said, okay, maybe it's time to use it for something else. And by the way, Blaise Aguirre Arcas, a wonderful mind behind the residency, he was very much predicting that 2016 was already like a kind of a starting point of this machine intelligence will for sure profoundly change the trajectory of arts. This is Mike Taika, my first mentor also in AI. Uh, he's also part of Deep Dream team. But what was really inspiring for me was his guidance. And not only him, but back in time, Ian Goodfellow, who is also the inventor of a GAN algorithms, which I'll, I can mention more. But what I found is opportunity to do something different than just a science fiction idea, but the idea of like, can we simulate the idea of a consciousness? Maybe a machine takes information turns into a knowledge and turns into a wisdom. And 2016 was a really early ideas for such a like invisible, you know, imagination with the machines. Heavily inspired by the Borges, I think uh, one of the most inspiring um, material of knowledge that I, I read, but also I was getting much inspired by the idea of a mental model. And, and, and it's eventually becoming much more understandable that, I mean, we know that like humans develop a mental model of the world based on what they are able to perceive with their limited senses. The decisions and the actions we make are based on this mental model. J. Wright Foster says the father of system dynamics, right? Like this was like a very understandable, it can be applied. And 2016 was my first challenge to understand this in archive dreaming. And, um, and I think now I'm really very inspired by the idea of like, can we use information, not data, but the knowledge for the context of machine and turn it into a dream and hallucinations. And I think what was really inspiring this project for me was not only understand AI, but also learn about something called latent space. For 
for AI, when, when machine learns information, it doesn't store the data in, in just like for us, we have like three dimensions, right? Or some people did the four dimension, but like we have like the context of X, Y, Z and time domain, but for machines, it's, it's n-dimensional. It's a Cartesian space or like manifold space. We, the, the space in the mind of a machine doesn't like, you know, have this, our physical quality of experience. And it was really inspiring. And the question was, of course, like, can we touch this? Like, can we hear, can we, can we learn from this? So 2016, I learned about these algorithms that are used for showing us what machine learned and how it actually compiles information. And back in then, I just obsessed with the idea of machine can hold the data, hold the information, and kind of clustered them in a way that can become a kind of a new entity, a new space. And this was the early steps of understanding this. And then, then all about like, this was like baby steps of AI and its understanding, like what else can we do with that? Um, so this is the very first data universe I was explaining in, in a library. And I thought that what, what will be really interesting is if a human, goes to a library and witness a machine is learning in front of him or her, that makes a kind of a new context. Like if I see a machine in front of me learning, it's an inspiration, I thought. Like it was a kind of a performative thinking, um, but it was really interesting. And then I think many of us library, I, I don't know, for me, libraries are one of the most divine places in the world where the knowledge comes from. And, and, and um, so I thought that maybe that's where we should start our journey like where the ideas, where the information comes from. And yeah, so like, I think that's, that's many other projects evolve around that. And then we, I was fortunate to work with, again, um, Mike Taika to learn about this DC GAN algorithm. You are watching a machine hallucinating 1.7 million documents. And then even we take the same idea, apply to music with Peter Sellers uh, last year, two years ago, we even, um, visualize uh, music does Paradis Schumann's piece in the form of TSNE, uh, sorry, the TSNE form and freeze the form and augment real time while the LA Master Choral was performing. And then TSNE form was real time listening to music and shape shifting the narrative. Um, and then later on, I think, and, and I think memories became much more contextually important and then um, Melting memories, unfortunate event of my uncle became much more, I think, um, heavy on, on my mind. And then I said, like, when I learned that the Alzheimer and dementia and the problems of disease in the, in the human mind is something like hit me very, very, very strongly. And then I said, like, why can't we touch our memories? I think it's a very simple, childish question. But why can't we, you know, um, touch our memories, emotions and feelings? Very, I think, childish questions. But thanks to Adam Gazzali, we were able to like record uh, more than 800 people's, I guess, individual memory recordings. Now with human connectome data, we have much more information, but it was one of the more first attempts of understanding how to touch memories and how can we visualize the moment of remembering. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions about that project as well. Uh, very much um, inspiring research here for me, my team, and I think the domain itself. Um, and then I think, um, pretty much for people here if if anyone really inspired about the gan algorithms especially the hallucination and the dreaming course of a machine um again thanks to the friends at nvidia uh, we are also part of um, this uh, a unique universe of nvidia um, as we we have some collaborators as a studio uh, and and tech giant friends are really asking sometimes wonderful research challenges and we are researching with the team who are sometimes developing these algorithms. And that's how Machine Hallucinations Project started. So, and if you're interested also, I'm happy to show you how this idea of a machine mind and how can we reconstruct reality from the machine's perspective and tools we are developing over the years, I'm happy to share as well. So I'm just showing a little bit, uh, the, 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 the things can be um, easily to show you today. Um, and I think um, maybe the finally from the TED talk, I think um, what was very um, truly, I think from my heart, it's one of the most inspiring project for me because of as a student dreaming an idea, hitting all the walls of reality and then finding a reason of why, what to do this it was 100 years of celebration of LA Philharmonic. And it was a beautiful one year of challenge, taking every single data of a building, every single data of institution, 
challenge me and the entire Google Arts and Culture team and reconstruct these memories in the form of pigmentation on the, onto the building of Disney Hall. And by the way, when I say memories of LA Phil, it's really big data, like 76,000 76, of recordings means it will take 37 years to listen. Like there is no way for a human, I guess, to hear everything here. Or like 90,000 video files, each of them two hours, to watch them 17 years. Like there's like an incredible amount of information here to like talk about. And I don't think it's possible without machine intelligence to imagine a world that can be done. And of course, lots of physical problems, technological challenges, how to augment such a major building, how to augment such a like a unique material, take Gary's original 2002 model and reconstruct it from scratch. Like there are like really steps of step challenges. Like an idea with the data doesn't like finish. Like it all adds and adds and adds. And in one year, we construct all the problems and reconstruct them in the form of narrative, I guess. Um, this is a project also very open to have a dialogue with you if you're interested. Um, and again, we have so funny visuals, like what happens if AI goes to a concert, what it sees, what it learns, what it feels. Um, and of course, memory of an institution as another question. The music sound, one of the most inspiring medium of, I think, uh, in arts. Like how, what the machine can do with a 76,000 sound recordings. And the idea was, can we create an instrument that can allow us to hear every single Mahler, Stravinsky, or Beethoven with a one click. Like imagine with one click, you are seeing 1956 Mozart recording, 2012 recording, and you can like correlate the time and space. This is really unique, weird, beautifully serendipitic feeling of you are flying in the mind of a machine. Like, by the way, every particle you see here represents 10 seconds long sound clips from the archive and clustered based on similarities. And technically, you are hearing similar sounds together, regardless of time. So it's a kind of a different ways of imagining an instrument. And then lastly, if one day a machine becomes a part of a building and the building becomes conscious, most likely, if I was an architecture, <laughs> I will ask, do I need to look like this, right? And then we thought, like, how it looks like if a, if a building can be loaded in a machine's mind. So we download every single image we could find about the building and let AI to learn, and then project it back to the building as its own consciousness, as its own dreams. So what we are seeing is one of the most, I think, challenging part of a project, and three-dimensionally training a neural network and reconstructing uh, the building surface with every single photo ever taken that we could find online uh, became a part of the building. So, but I think truly public art is where I think the idea became much more inspiring because when it's public art, first of all, Los Angeles is not a place people are going out, not a place, even before pandemic, we don't have too much public events. We don't have too much um, events going on in public space. The city is large and big and commuting public space is challenging with the car culture. But when you see 100,000 people coming together for five nights with their friends and families and dogs and it just became a different connect connection with the surface of the building, but the context of public space appear. There is no ticket, there is no ceiling, right? There is no door, it's just there. Um, and, and I think most importantly, not only the building augmentation, but also like seeing the hero one more time, saying that, oh, finally, the building may remember me was an incredible, like, again, a, an experience. And now we are not only working with only this, this um, scale, but we are also working with the United Nations at the moment and trying to understand their uh, archives. Um, and it's a very also interesting research going on in the studio. So happy to like um, talk about all these open projects today with you. So thank you for a quick, um, quick wrap up. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Extraordinary. Oof. Yeah. Okay. If we, if we really want to speak about everything we want to speak with Vic, we'll probably be here till midnight tonight. It, there's so much amazing things to talk about. But I think Easton uh, wrote to me. So Easton, there's like a burning question that you wanted to ask. Yeah, please, please. Happy to. Yeah. So um, since, since this question hit me, uh, you mentioned some other things that, that uh, seem to feed on to, to the topic. Um, I was just, uh, I was reviewing some, stati some statistics programming stuff with a fellow uh, lab mate. And I, at some point I said, man, I'm looking forward to the time when I'll be able to simply put a hat on that connects to my brain 
and I'm simply going to be able to visualize how these this statistics work so that I can more intuitively engage with it instead of trying to read it and understand the person's wording to get into my mind, to get it back onto my fingers, onto the keyboard. Um, so I, I'm, in, I'm curious to know what your thought is about that and maybe what you see your involvement is in, in maybe eventually helping us visualize data in our heads or some other way. So, so I think it's a great, great question and great challenge. So at the moment, we are um, working on a very funny challenge uh, with human connectome project data sets for Vinis Biennale. And it's a really interesting challenge to understand. Um, so first of all, I think neuroscience itself is one of the most deepest, but also still unknown territory of right, their research. And I think, again, who knows what will happen with the uh, Neuralink or similar other BCI research. Well, I can say, at least from a very humble research, we are trying to connect a human brain um, to latent space. So I think, so for everyone, again, latent space is really inspiring space, I think. And, and for people who want to understand how AI works and creates things, I think we all need to understand latent space. Uh, otherwise, I don't think we have a communication chance with the machine's mind at the moment, at least. So what is we are trying in a high level is, like, can we connect the BCI of a, of a human mind and let alone a human mind flies in the mind of a machine, just to give you a little bit much direct uh, maybe ex example. So imagine, again, this is a very like a, a humble research in, in the studio, I don't know where it goes, but um, imagine, so, so I think, oh, not this one. So this, uh, this file, okay. So this was like a, maybe I was gonna show, um, this is the experience that I am holding a joystick, like a game joystick. So on the left side, what we are seeing is a three-dimensional representation of what machine learned. And this is specific the Renaissance research we are doing at the moment. Like imagine every single building in Renaissance and their photo archives of half million images. And AI learns all the patterns in the, in the data. And, but the question is, like, how can we perceive this universe? Like how can we interact with this universe? So one idea of course was, okay, maybe we can sample some um, data from the machine's mind and cluster them based on similarity on the left side. And maybe when I'm flying in the mind of a machine, we can find a similarity on the right side. So imagine this like um, a paper, a paper that has an, a magnetic surface, right? But this surface is not flat. It can be also a little bit like a noisy and like kind of a wobbly surface. And, and this, is, this is you and you can fly this thing in the mind of an N dimension. And whenever your desire of visual you are trying to find sticks into this surface, that's what you see on the right side. It's kind of like sampling from a machine's mind. And here we are trying a similar idea that you mentioned that how can we really connect the mind to here? So the, of course, the fastest one is um, using uh, BCI. We are using a 32 channel EG device. And then uh, a friend, uh, also the team member, Matt uh, Rosenberg from Caltech, and he is helping us to really know how exactly we can find the pattern of EEG signal that tells the story of, you know, desire of a flying in the mind of a machine. So we are just finding those very high level research, but that's the most closest answer I have practically uh, where it may happen. Uh, but it's a really beautiful challenge and it's a beautiful question to find that context. So I know that uh, a lot of you, if you have questions, but I know that Adam is about 30 questions you want to ask. So why don't you start with one, Adam? Um, uh, I wanted to ask a precursor question. Uh, do you often use Rhino for your modeling? Uh, so I, Rhino was in the very, I think, um, grad years, yes. Now Houdini, Cinema 4D are much more uh, common but also Unreal Engine and Unity game engines are extremely, extremely functional. Yeah. It's, it's interestingly, game engines are probably more functional than before. I just saw the Grasshopper script and it gave me oh, the, 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 there, was, <laughs> there was the first, uh, first script, 2011. Uh, I was yeah. exploring the data set of sound data sets of the streets and then FFT analyzing the surface of the street and then turn it into like ISO play. Yeah. But 
so this uh this follow-up question has a has a lot of premise i guess um so what you do is analyze data sets uh interpret those data sets using machine learning and um uh give it a visual output uh i'm interested where it, where your intervention is as an artist is it in choosing uh the visual quality of the data set after the machine has learned is it how the machine learns itself uh what is your input into the system so that uh only Rafik and Adol can make this product oh it's a great question i think there's like a three stages of this experience so first of all curating data like what is the knowledge what is the information what is the memory so that means that if you like let's say explore renaissance which is in this context um, luckily, we have an institution that is given the data set from a luckily clean data. That means already, you know, maintained from a library and a very well curated information. But there are moments, for example, we don't have this opportunity. For example, for New York project, we have 113 million images of New York. Like there is no single way to look at this data, right? And especially cleaning data is very important. Uh, heavily, we are focusing on collective memories. We do not worry about personal information and try to find how to find. Also, another AI research is finding the images that doesn't belong to the concept. Like, for example, if you think about New York, can it be like the image in every single photos of like flat iron building, right? So we, we are trying to find that photos, not the people like next to itself. But really, there's a major research going on there. And then that's imagine you sample this information and now you have the information and then train the inf train the gen algorithm while training there's a lot of like decisions right when when the machine learns you have an opportunity to say how much you want it to learn and how how want how how much sampling or like there are so many parameters that you can allow machine to even speculate or less speculate let's call it and there are also parameters there artistic decisions and lastly what is the hallucination state right what exactly this dream made of. And that is another like decision of artistic decisions. And then when this universe appears, the last step of pigmentation starts here, which is I think a good example here I can give you. Um, for example, currently working for NASA GPL and for NASA archives, last almost two years, I can say, there's an incredible information coming from the space. And I think, imagine a machine's memories, right? Like Mars, MRO, this, the, the beautiful machine in taking every single Mars surface, 12 terabytes of every single photo of the Mars. So this is, for example, less about you know, the data, but more about what else can we do with data. When machine learns this information, by the way, these are patterns of data from the Mars. Here, the artistic process starts, for example, can we look at anthropologically what machine learns? So imagine that you are, kind of archaeologically looking at the, every single layers of the sand from the machine's mind, and you can slice through this universe. Like this is, these are purely artistic exploration of data, uh, or like you know, creating a new space from the information, or even like find new pigmentation from the same data. So this whole process, I think, really depends on the algorithm or the context of the space or the canvas. Um, and these are all like, like it, it all starts with the data, a machine, also gives us outputs, but then there's a whole new universe of artistic exploration. Like from the very first image, which are these are, are becoming something completely different. And then that's where the artistic journey starts, I think. Cool. Um, thank you. And um, follow up question uh, Since you augment spaces using surfaces, usually with projectors, um, whether it's a small scale room where you're teleported to a different space or a different dimension, as you put it, in a dream world, or you project onto um, the, the inside of the Disney hall. Um, do you think there is a limitation because you only project visually? Uh, or in other words, how would you respond to a critique where um, the f the phenomenology in which you work is almost always visual or almost exclusively even visual oh that's a very great question so i think i think that at least light as a material is one of those like materials in life in science that we know that can shape 
can take any shape, right, at the moment for this purpose. Um, and I think when I was at least researching, like if I can take my brush and dip it into minds of a machine and paint with mission consciousness, I mean, I, honestly, I don't know any other material that can truly hold this flux space um, at the moment. Uh, there may be some research and of course living, living entities, bacteria, like micro, I mean, there's like a nanoscale world of, I'm sure, organisms that can be also perceived in that universe. Or even like, if you think about quantum mechanics at the moment, we are researching for quantum memories for a project in NGV with the quantum AI team at Google, working with the quantum supremacy data. But even there, we have a similar problem, right? Like there's a universe that we don't see and perceive, but we know that it's there scientifically. It doesn't mean we can touch or interact with it. And I think this light is so far the most exciting material that is allowing that um, at, at this scale. It is, it is an imagination space. Um, but I don't feel it's limited. I, I feel like it's liberated. It's just a freedom of like material that, I mean, again, if it's not working, it can disappear. Um, and, and it's against gravity. <laughs> it can go anywhere. And I mean, it can be particle or wavelengths and it can be anything we want. So I don't know any other material, to be honest, can do that. That's fair. Um, I feel like some people would try to. Yeah, build. yeah, maybe. <laughs> let's, let's see if we have another, another question from someone else. I thought I have plenty. I, come on, come on. I'm sure there are, there are questions there. I, I know, I know. I know your minds. They're full of questions. Yes, Damien. I was expecting you. Uh, yeah, no, I was actually a uh, subversion of expectations. If you know what, I'm actually curious, Adam, if you have any more questions, uh, <laughs> could you keep asking them? No, because these are actually excellent. Um, and uh, I think your perspective at architecture is really valuable. So I do have some, but. Um, okay, but let, if, let, let's, 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 let's first see if anyone else has another question. I know Adam's a great question, but I want to make sure that some of you are able to ask some of the questions you want to ask if it's burning. Yes, Damien, don't you want to, don't you have a question about consciousness? I'm sure you do. Um, I have a quick question, just okay, like it's more cherry. of a, uh, it's not really a big philosophical question. I just have a quick like procedural question. You mentioned that you were really inspired by TSNE. I was just wondering if all of your structures are built using that dimensional reduction or if you tried other forms like UMAP or... Yes. Actually, TS, exactly, TSNE was the first one, 2016 and 17. And since UMAP uh, invented, I guess, we only use UMAP in many works. Um, okay. And for example, for TED Talk, I was able to apply the UMAP to entire TED archives or like uh, Disney Hall project was TSNE and UMAP. Um, and I think UMAP is pretty interesting because oh, also recently in the city of Portland, we were able to 3D print a UMAP. With a 3D large scale robotic mm -hmm. print, we voxelize the space um, and turn it into a data crystal. And that was also a UMAP algorithm. It has a really inspiring result. And also, the, also is, is a QML, right? CUML from NVIDIA that allows you to compute much faster. Um, there are some really exciting results coming up. And I think artistically, the shapes at the UMAP findings are also very inspiring. I don't know how to say it, but they're more dynamic and the clustering is more innovative. Um, they're, they're fun to work with, I think. For people, the UMAP is, uh, and TSNE algorithms are really very open-minding uh, finds of understanding what machine learn from a pattern of information. Uh, this can be a sound, text, or image. Um, it allows you to like sample out what the decision of a machine based on the similarities or context. And then semantics also in the text, they are really inspiring um, AI models going on. Um, and I think they're very essential for us to understand what machine learned, learns. Daniel, I think you have a question. Mm -hmm. I, I was curious um, if, if in your works um, and just going through all these processes, how you might have been, how you, how this technology might in, then inform back towards us. Mm. How does this technology suggest um, how we perceive ourselves in the world and how has, how do new tech, how are new technologies augmenting this? And, you know, even in your personal experience, how, um, how have they informed, you know, what the human body and mind is, is capable of 
and, and how is that changing in, in the 21st century? So, so it's a beautiful question, but I think to answer it really hard, but I know that mm -hmm. one thing that, that at least a practical research that I'm seeing that is working is, for example, a project archive dreaming that I know that it's a one example of um, a functional art space that is, yes, artistically, maybe science fiction experience, but it's really a researchable space. For example, a, six, um, a PhD student in, in, in her sixth year, she was trying to find a document in the same archive for six years. And she never able to know that there was a connection between two documents from company. Mm -hmm. It's very like she said, it's impossible to really even imagine there was a connection between that two different metadata, at least in a, in a, in a classical computing, like searching a bar or interacting with a knowledge with a search bar. It's always a limitation, right? Because you, how do you start? How do you know what you learn? Like, how do you know what you, and then, and she said it's the first time she saw there is a connection between that two universe and then she opened up a new universe. I think this kind of ideas, I think, may allow us to, again, go beyond what we can see. Um, mm -hmm. That's a very functional research, I guess, there. And the secondly, um, right now with DeepMind, um, what they are doing, like, I mean, it's pretty clear that AI may be the most objective, <laughs> tool if we are not biased in the beginning which is a big problem i know but if we can achieve that curated objectivity in the very beginning if we can achieve that we have something truly objective but again like somebody is deciding what it is so it's, it's there's a fundamental problem there I, i'm aware of it but there's still a higher chance than a human <laughs> right because it doesn't forget right this machine doesn't forget so and the third thing I'm seeing a lot is the memory research. So what I found that in mounting memories, especially, so the exhibition is traveling all over the world, but there's always this very unique reaction. Like people are seeing a noise algorithm. It's completely, there is nothing there to be really recoverable, but I'm getting personal messages like people are saying, it's the first time I'm aware of my gender. It's the first time I'm aware of my trauma in life. I'm aware. Like I am getting personally incredibly important, I think personal notes that in different skills on different countries and backgrounds. So that means art has maybe that potential to, 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 to unfold the universe that maybe allows us to think or talk different. Maybe it's not a book, maybe not a cinema, but maybe not a music, but that combination of feeling. Mm -hmm. It's very unique that we are talking with now uh, Anil Sets and or um, Human Connect on project, like really understanding like, is it unlocking something that a combination of imagination or a truly triggering a cognitive state that allows people to do something different. Um, so maybe it is, and I don't think we are super aware of what that is, but I think, I think there is something there, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very beautiful. It really seems like um, there's, there's some like intuitive connection with, with things that you're doing. They're not, it's not just something completely new that I'm seeing. It's 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 almost speaking to something that has always been there, but has never been articulated before. Yes. And again, I think if art is for anyone, any age and any background, believe me, that becomes a beautiful challenge for everyone. Like, what is that common language that is not biased? <laughs> like, what is that? Thanks so much. I do have a, a question, Rafik. In, in your TED talk, you, you, you mentioned the, the, the android, the Rachel, right, in Blade Runner, who, who doesn't know that her, her memories are not hers, right? And that's the whole question about memories. But in a way, when your machine hallucinates, don't they hallucinate our own memories? It's like a resonance of, of, of what human beings are, right? Because it's archives of human pictures and data and TED talks. So it's as if you're reproducing Rachel, right? She's hallucinating our own, the re own resonance of our own dreams. Yep, exactly. And I think what is really, really um, um, sometimes meaningful and purposeful is when AI really focuses on the collective memories, right? Eventually creates collective dreams or collective hallucinations. And I think instead of individually concern about our privacy, like what else we can do with AI that maybe com compiles these collective memories? Like what is the humanity's collective memories that is like hard to compile together, but that may be a way of like looking at them. And again, Rachel there is a one individual 
an entity for a machine, but how can the applied that mind that model to humanity? Like if we scale up to the every, every single, you know, conscious mind and soul, like what is that pattern of memory? Um, is, was the inspiration there? Sherry, Sherry you, had a, you had a question. Th thank you, Rafik, the amazing answer. Sherry, um, go ahead. Hello, yes, I have a question that just kind of popped into my head. I was like looking at some of your work and thinking about what you said about earlier when you said, you know, people don't usually go in LA and this big projection kind of brought people all together and the all everyone was kind of sitting there and appreciating something that's bigger than themselves. But if in all of your works, like if we took the human out of it and like there's no human appreciating your work, like can the machine appreciate its own beauty and its own imagination, its own hallucination, its own memory. Like, because I feel like in all of this, there's a human there and its beauty is being extracted from the idea that a human is appreciating something that's bigger than itself, that it's looking at connections that machines are making that we wouldn't otherwise be able to make. But what if it's not about humans in the 21st century? What if it's machines appreciating its own beauty in the 21st century? Like, can we get to a point where how, how would it look like if one day the machine is looking at it itself and looking at its own memories and thinking, dang, that's freaking cool. You know, that's like, could we, could we get there? Or what would that look like? I don't super, know. Super great question. And really, like neurons are connecting, but I think the, what is this? Again, it, it may not be the best example that I, 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 I'm feeling at the moment that, so, so at the moment, we are trying to understand what is quantum mechanics, what is quantum computation. I think that's one of the most inspiring things that's happening to humanity, which will take who knows how many decades to become really functional. But um, <laughs> for, for NGV project, we are speculating something different. So we know that the science is trying to understand nature, right? And, and nature is a key word for machine is so maybe boring, not a boring, but something just nature means like every single nature, landscapes, waters, clouds, like things that represent nature for humanity. Like imagine as we are humans collecting our memories by hashtags, right? At the moment, at least a reaction, like not writing physically, but for the virtual space, we are taking our memories, right? Our behaviors. So we are looking at now this pattern of nature. And, and we are trying to say that most likely quantum mechanics cannot be perceived by human eye. Like there is no way that we will be able to like see how like a subatomic world behaves and moves and changes. But perhaps AI can help us. Perhaps AI can look at that universe and unfold the universe for us. Maybe it finds a fluctuation and then gives a re 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 resonates into another dimension. If Schrodinger's cat is true or like other quantum mechanic theories are true or many worlds theories is true, if there is any other many worlds, that's most likely only available to a really subatomic world, right? So maybe there, the question was amazing. Maybe there, that universe exists there. And maybe there, AI <laughs> can have the leisure of beauty or its own narcissist world of image. I don't know what it is, but if there's a mission, there's a consciousness. If there's a free will of a machine, which is, I don't know what it is, but... That's where that is. That's where you are saying. <laughs> but I don't know how to explain that in space. It's, it's hard to visualize beyond just cables and sensors and <laughs> bits and bytes and qubits. Yeah, um, for sure. No, thank you. That was a really interesting perspective to think about. And there's like questions if, popping up. <laughs> if, if it was an AI, I would really look for nature very quickly, right? Why these humans are coming? Like, what is nature? What is space? I mean, yeah. What is the first question of an AI would ask, right? If it's sentiment, but I, mm. Mm. thank you. Yeah, I have a, a question. Uh, that there was a, one slide in your presentation where there was this actually like very beautifully sort of stylized timeline of the instances where AI has sort of uh, yeah. led to undesirable consequences, like automatic car crashes and um, you know election meddling and, and that sort of thing, and. Um, uh, this is actually somewhat connected to Adam's first question that like, it seems that what AI is doing uh, is to, lar to a large part a function of uh, what the parameters of the data are and what the output is translated into. So for example, um, 
uh, you were mentioning that like one of your installations was dealing with like the memory of like a street, right? And uh, it was creating this incredibly beautiful, you know, um, artistic rendition as a consequence. Um, but at the same time, I was thinking of how, like maybe you guys remember this a few years ago in the UK, um, there was this sort of experimental program where uh, police were trying to like uh, predict where crime was going to happen. And so they ran through this huge database of um, people and they lumped them together, you know, based on the similarity of like how likely it is they're going to commit crime. And then, you know, it became controversial because it was very racialized. Um, and so I guess the question is like, what is the role of um, turning the output into an artistic endeavor in having a responsible relationship with AI? Um, it's, right. It's, it's a really beautiful question. I mean, I think, I think when, once we have AI as a collaborator, right, as a mission, as a collaborator, I think eventually everything has a different contextualization of reality, right? Because, I mean, of course, when Monet depicts the atmosphere, right, when, when he was just drawing beautiful, abstract, atmospheric experience of life versus an AI looks at the patterns of high frequency and other activities of a sea surface and reconstruct the sea surface, there's just a significant differences, right? Because we know that one is more scientific, quant quantified and recoverable. And there's like all these mathematical context of reality versus on the other hand, in the, oh, sorry, on the other hand, uh, we had a, like a major um, abstraction of thoughts back in time. So, but AI means there's a, grounding part to reality like there is something that you can remember again you can trace back to where it comes from um, it's kind of a thinking pigment a thinking brush together mm. so really like a thinking brush is a very good analogy like because you're really working with something thinking at the moment of before it just gets frozen um, that's really interesting like if you melt that frozen pigment you are you can go back to the reality of where it comes from um, so that's kind of the feeling when you say there's like very meaningful research data sets, um, can be emotion data, neuroscientific data, social media data, right? Like now there's elections and like there's an incredible amount of information have been like produced just artificially or naturally, who knows. But um, and at the end, mission just looks at one and zeros, right? Until it's qubits. So it's just a very weird reality that mission is just, Look at mathematically, and then, um, so you are technically painting with something very analytic, very quant quantified object of things that are pigmented. <laughs> so it's very fermented. It's it's very unique. Uh, it's a great question, but I don't, I don't think it is a very simple way of deconstructing if a pigment is coming from a knowledge versus. And imagination like it, it, they are very similar but also very different because of machines context so uh, one question i would have ask you is what is what is you know how do we as an artist uh, how do you using you know the thinking brush you guys the thinking brush using data as your canvas using this quantifiable mathematical material, how do you create the sublime? And how do you aim at creating, how do you I mean, try to reach and seek the sublime doing this? And how does it change from Monet, for example? Hmm. I think, I think maybe I can share this quickly because I think this is a very good example of, um, I have also a very um, inspiring quote for me. So I think it was, First of all, the serendipity also comes from the, the collectors. For example, there was a collector in Boston and he was really asking for a painting that wants to, he wants to move, like he wants this painting to move. Like it was a beautiful, confusing brief from a collector to an artist, right? Like even back in the Renaissance, like what had been the painters were like, you know, focused on versus, you know, a, 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 a genius collector really just want to go beyond the canvas. They don't, it's a very unique collaboration sometimes happens. And, and, and they were like very much into this idea of um, a moving painting. And I said like, maybe that's perfect time. And by the way, Casey Rias, one of my hero and mentor, who is also the inventor of processing with Ben Fry, 
uh, processing is a very important um, computational language that allows creators to create um, tools and programs for creative reasons as a JavaScript based um, program. In 2012, I started thinking about this idea, like can data become a pigment? But for example, the wind data, right? Like one of the most, I mean, invisible pattern of life, a movement of nature. Um, and, and, and this phenomena itself happens all the time, but we don't, you know, touch it. You know, it touches us, but we cannot like, you know, record and hold it. And I was just very inspired by this idea. And like, but then when we think about wind data or temperature, it's quantified and a sensor can give a meaning to this data. And then you have a wind speed, air pressure, temperature, and wind direction. But then the imagination starts here. What will happen if this data becomes this spherical surface that carves this painting constantly based on the wind direction and temperature and the speed and the degree of direction of the wind pattern? And then eventually you have these new models of reality. You suddenly have this simulation engine, simulation toy or game that allows you to like create this new universe. That means that you have now particles or pigmented particles. And then now the wind and the temperature becomes this new brush. And that brush can move based on the nature of life. So like this kind of ideation, then, then eventually um, we, we got these wind data paintings, for example. But it was like a very, um, very obvious um, um, transformation of information, but I think that's where the sublime may, may come. <sighs> but I want to read something um, about Philip K. Dick here, if you allow me, because I think this answer is really very good for that. He says, reality is that which doesn't go away when you stop believing in it. A simulation is that which doesn't stop when the stories go away. Stories are responsible to our human desire for resolution but a simulation is responsible only to its own laws and initializing conditions. A simulation has no moral prejudice or meaning like nature, it just is. I think it's exactly a very similar feeling of simulation of a nature to the lens of a machine. And that's, I think, where I found the poetry uh, for this series. Jerry, you raised your hand again. Oh, I think I just never unraised my hand, but if others don't have a question, I could ask another question. <laughs> oh, actually, I think Daniel just raised his hand. Daniel, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to ask a quick follow-up to that. Um, I was wondering, like, uh, um, in neuroscience research, they've, like, it's been known for a bit that humans group certain types of, of sensory data together, like higher pitches correlated often with brighter, with brighter colors and stuff. Have you found that, you know, in the world of data, if there are certain pigments that naturally tend to correlate with, mm -hmm. if there are sort of natural correlations with, with elements of human experience that are kind of like, you know, not imposed by you or other artists? Well, that's a beautiful question. I think, um, I, I'm not sure if it's a very good, good example, but at least we are trying to understand at the moment, sense of space, like what, what happens when we sense a space, right? Um, it's not the same thing century ago, right? Because now we have Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, 5G, LTE. We have a universe around us that doesn't exist, right? I mean, there is, but we cannot perceive or feel, but we know that like here right now, there are machines communicating each other. <sighs> machines are doing something here. But can we really feel this? I don't think so at the moment without any device or augmented you know, um, tools. So probably very similar thing happening in our consciousness. Most likely very similar neuroscientific, hopefully, discoveries will happen in a similar fashion. Even though we know the Bluetooth signal at the moment between my phone and, and this watch is doing the similar communication, which we cannot perceive, but it exists. There are very similar existing, I think, neural connections between mm -hmm. many different conscious models of things. Um, so maybe AI will most likely be a tool truly to un unveil those patterns. 
uh, between the feelings, between the maybe memory patterns, between the maybe like traumas or between the things that uh, only exist again through the lens of a machine. And even I think there was an interesting dialogue a couple of weeks ago at the UCLA's um, Brain Mapping Center. There are really interesting dialogues about maybe machine can be more subjective than a human to its own existence. Even like I think like psychedelic research at the moment is exploring very similar ideas. Like what exactly happening in the human mind that is interconnected with itself in a way that we cannot do in a normal state? Why exactly psychedelics can do that, but we cannot do it unless we are a guru of meditation or something extremely like a trained mind or soul. So, so, that, so, so there are very similar answers to that question, I think, around there, I think. But I don't know what it is. <laughs> but that's around there is very exciting. Thanks so much. So it's 5.22, and I think uh, we have to let our guest uh, leave soon. Let's have one more question. Uh, Adam, you're supposed to have all the great questions. Uh, yes. By the way, uh, every, every question, thank you, Vibe. Really, really, one of the most brain uh, <laughs> yes, massage. Uh, they're very involved. I, I really enjoy um, having these uh, with everyone. So curious. Uh, it's, it's a great feeling. Um, but my... My last question actually is one of curiosity. Uh, are you looking to go into building worlds in VR instead of augmenting reality? And what do you think are the, are the changes between actually playing with light in, in, in augmenting reality versus actually building a world from scratch? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Um, so at the moment, I mean, very openly, 2014, I was one of the first also developer for Oculus in the very early days. So I'm very aware of the medium and its, its evolution, but very openly saying, being aware of wearing a device on your head with a couple of kilograms or whatever, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's a, of course, a transition. I mean, it's for sure, it's a predictable transition, but I feel it's extremely forced perspective. It's first forced experience. But what I like a lot recently is this XR, the expand, expanded reality experiences, like such as a machine looks where am I and where, where I stay, where I look, and then it kind of a, create a dialogue between the machine's perception and my perception. Like, like can we use machines' ability to like look who we are, but we, what we want to do, a dialogue between that? And then augment the reality that what we are seeing. For example, a painting that you are looking, and the, and the painting has this conscious model that knows where you are, and then it just reacts to that. And it's actually truly augmenting the physical reality, but not wearing anything. And still you perceive a similar augmented reality experiences. So this is kind of altering the physical reality. I know it's not the same thing that you augment yourself by machine, but machine is still there but augmenting it's your reality that is physically there, if it makes sense. I think, I think we didn't explore this realm too much. We jumped to VR and AR so quickly, I think we a little bit leave this alone, area alone. So there's not too much research going on truly augmenting physical reality yet. Uh, maybe that's more inspiring because of that. Uh, but definitely AR, VR is incredibly powerful contextual machine language, I guess, can be used for different narratives. All right. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, brain is exploding. It was, it, it, was, it was really amazing, really. Thank you so much for your generosity, for the time you took to speak to us. T thank you for intellectually so deep and meaningful questions. As I said, it's so rare to connect with wonderful minds together. So it's so great yeah. to be connected. And thank you again. We'll put it on the website when it's ready. We'll send you, we'll send you a link. Uh, feel free also to use it as much as you want. I mean, this is all open and we share content. And again, thank you so much. It was helpful. It was amazing, intriguing. And uh, really, uh, you know, can't wait to see it, uh, to be able to really, really uh, share within, you know, and delve into machine consciousness yes. and with all this new emotion that, we're, that you're giving us access to. Thank you very much. And thank you for the wonderful question again. Have a wonderful and safe future. Thank you so much, Kafik. Thank, thank you, you so much. Great to meet you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.